For our ninth and final interview, we're delighted to have with us Ellen M, head of China real estate at Warburg Pincus Asia LLC. Ellen, Warburg Pincus has been actively investing globally in what we now call new economy investments. This is also a new category that we created for MIPIM Asia Awards in 2020. Mm -hmm. What are the new economy investments that you feel have the most potential in China? Right. Um, to frame this a little bit, you know, new economy, by that we refer to all the infrastructure plays, logistics, data centers, um, technology and biotech parks. Mm -hmm. It can even loop in sort of for rental apartments, uh, multifamily into that category, okay. given how nascent that segment is in, in the context of China across the region. Um, you know, today that makes up roughly three quarters of our entire portfolio. So we've been very much, wow. um, you know, skewed towards uh, those, those favors asset classes. Okay. Now, as an institutional investor, what have been some of the challenges that you, you have faced this year and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, obviously, the last this year, the past 12 months have been um, exceptional. Um, I think it, it happens in different phases. In the initial uh, quarters of the outbreak, in, in the context of China, Q1, Q2 last year, uh, obviously the the key challenge was making sure the banking relationships and people were initially shocked by the disruption, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in in real estate, you can get the area that you could get um, you could suffer is if you have too much leverage. So across the portfolio, fortunately, we're very moderately uh, leveraged, but mm -hmm. there's still, when there are disruptions to the operations in some of our businesses that required uh, conversations with banks. Um, and But very very quickly, uh, uh, we had, most of our business have gone back to normalized levels. Um, you know, our most hit business was actually a car park company in China. Mm -hmm. uh, at the peak of the pandemic, it was at 20% of utilization mm. uh, by mid last year has already been back to pre-COVID levels. So it's quite short duration. Um, and then closer to end of last year, I think overall uh, the, the challenge was, you know, physically we can't always be on the ground. Mm. So in terms of grooming new relationships and operating partners, uh, I took more innovative different ways of uh, working uh, with new partners particularly. Uh, that said, most of our team is also on the ground in China. So that had help um, you know, manage some of these relationships. Now, because your business is in China, China has done a pretty good job in controlling COVID compared mm -hmm. with the rest of the world. That has obviously worked in your favor. Do you see that continuing or, or compared with the rest of the world and, and as other markets deal with COVID and its implications? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so we are obviously a very interconnected world and our clients, our LP, uh, capital partners are all all globally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in terms of deployment of capital and the fundamentals uh, of what we have invested in, obviously we're we're a bit fortunate in that this has the China economy has uh, gone back back to relatively normalized levels sooner, right? But we expect sort of waves and and you know surprises. I think we're now as, as having a bigger appetite for surprises. Sure. But the, you know, by and large, I think the fundamentals have been very robust. And if anything, the um, pandemic last year has shown the resilience and the acceleration of some of the growth areas that we are very much focused on in these new economy sectors. Mm. Do you think investment strategies uh, will change or evolve as a, as a result of COVID, both in China and in other parts of the region? And what will those changes look like? Um, again, I think the way we've positioned our portfolio, it was not, you know, preparing for the COVID. It was, you know, some of these themes, in our view, are long-term, what we call decade durable secular trends. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we've been playing logistics for 10 years now uh, in China. And when we started, it was, you know, online shopping penetration was 2%. Now it's 25% of all shopping levels. Wow. So that has, um, that has clearly been a good journey but even today, with the uh, impact of COVID, there's some acceleration. We are still very underserved and underbuilt uh, in terms of logistics infrastructure compared to development levels, right? Mm -hmm. If you count all the modern logistics in China, there's more uh, modern warehouses in the state of California than the entirety of the country. Mm -hmm. So even with a pretty long run of capital interest, a lot more development, because of the sheer scale of the demand, uh, in a country like China, and that 
today, the most of the developers are still focused on for sale um, residential, right? So in some of these newer, uh, new economy sectors, we're seeing you know, very robust demand uh, versus um, you know, insufficient supply. And the same goes uh, to other asset classes like data centers where you have probably six, seven times the internet population in across Asia compared to developed markets, but one, one tenth of the capacity. Um, so, you know, we see with, with or without the impact of COVID, these are going to really play out over the next 10 years, if not more. So you're excited about logistics, excited about data centers. Are there cities in China that you are particularly excited about where uh, you think this could, be, this could be the next big thing? Uh, you know, for a lot of these sectors, they are national wide, right? Obviously, the infra in terms of infrastructure serving, um, uh, internet usage, serving, you know, fulfillment needs of e-commerce players. Uh, these, they are naturally surrounded in major cities, with the more populated cities. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing sort of new drivers of growth within these uh, bigger food groups, right? Within logistics, is emerged from a niche sector into a much bigger food group. And there are now new drivers like grocery deliveries, right? Which generates new uh, fulfillment infrastructure in across the country, not just the big cities. So there aren't sort of one city or a couple of cities that stand out per se. I think these are trends that are applicable to the broader population across many markets. Okay, for my final question for you, I also want to bring it back to the awards. Mm -hmm. uh, as a jury member for a few years now, uh, was there a, a project this year uh, that you found especially exciting, that, that you, you felt like this is something that is very special or different from ones you've seen in the past? Um, I think from my standpoint, we're very glad to see some of our projects that are managed by our operating partners were uh, made, made you know, some of the, won some of the awards, be it ESR winning the, you know, uh, the Green Award, uh, as well as the new, new whole category around infrastructure um, and, and the asset classes. I think that has been a big progress. Um, and other sectors like even traditional office buildings, some of our portfolio projects have uh, made it to the best green buildings. So those, those are very special um, personally to us. Um, in general, I think the, as some of our earlier speakers have shared, the caliber of um, some of the mixed use projects have been quite special, not only in new development, but in the regeneration projects, mm -hmm. right? So it also represents a shift from just building you know, big elephant projects mm -hmm. uh, to more operational intensive and paying more attention to sustainability. Um, and better uses of uh, resources, be it land or just, just um, you know, better, better uses of space. Okay, thank you very much for talking with thank us. Thank you for having me. Ellen Wu, Warburg Pincus, thank you. Thank you.